The Individual's Education Every human being comes into the world devoid of the faculties characteristic of fully developed human beings. This does not mean simply the ability to see clearly, to move around, to feed oneself, etc. Above all, it means he is devoid of reasoning power, the power that distinguishes man from animals. But the crucial distinction between the baby and other animals is that these powers, in particular the ability to reason, are potentially within him. The process of growing up is the process of the development of the child's faculties. From a state of helplessness and incompetence, such as few newly born animals are burdened with, the infant grows up to the glory of the full stature of an adult. Because they are immediately apparent to the senses, it is easy to overestimate the purely physical nature of these changes. The baby's growth in height and weight, learning how to walk and talk, etc., may be viewed in terms of the isolated physical or muscular activities involved. The overwhelmingly important feature of the growing up process is mental, the development of mental powers, or perception and reason. The child using the new mental powers learns and acquires knowledge. Knowledge not only about the world around him, but also about himself. Thus, his learning to walk and talk, and his direction of these powers, depends upon his mental capacity to acquire this knowledge and to use it. As the child exercises his new reasoning, as well as muscular powers, these powers grow and develop which in turn furnishes an impetus for the child's further exercise of these faculties. Specifically, the child learns about the world around him, other children and adults, and his own mental and physical powers. Every child coming into the world comes into a certain environment. This environment consists of physical things, natural and man-made, and other human beings with whom he comes in contact in various ways. It is this environment upon which he exercises his developing powers. His reason forms judgments about other people, about his relationships with them and with the world in general. His reason reveals to him his own desires and his physical powers. In this way, the growing child, working with his environment, develops ends and discovers means to achieve them. His ends are based on his own personality, the moral principles he has concluded are best, and his aesthetic tastes. His knowledge of means is based on what he has learned is most appropriate. This body of theory in which he believes he has acquired with his reasoning powers, either from the direct experience of himself or others, or from logical deduction by himself or by others. When he finally reaches adulthood, he has developed his faculties to whatever extent he can, and has acquired a set of values, principles, and scientific knowledge. This entire process of growing up, of developing all the facets of a man's personality, is his education. It is obvious that a person acquires his education in all activities of his childhood. All his waking hours are spent in learning, in one form or another. It is clearly absurd to limit the term education to a person's formal schooling. He is learning all the time. He learns and forms ideas about other people, their desires and actions to achieve them, the world and the natural laws that govern it and his own ends and how to achieve them. He formulates ideas on the nature of man and what his own and others' ends should be in light of this nature. This is a continual process, and it is obvious that formal schooling constitutes only an item in this process. In a fundamental sense, as a matter of fact, everyone is self-educated. A person's environment physical or social, does not determine the ideas and knowledge with which he will emerge as an adult. It is a fundamental fact of human nature that a person's ideas are formed for himself. Others may influence them, 
but none can determine absolutely the ideas and values which the individual will adopt or maintain through life. Formal instruction If everyone is constantly learning, and each child's life is his education, why the need for formal education? The need for formal instruction stems from the fact that a child's faculties are undeveloped and only potential, and that they need experience in order to develop. In order for this exercise to take place, the child needs the environmental materials on which he can operate and with which he can work. Now it is clear that for a large segment of his general education, he does not need systematic formal instruction. The space is almost always available for his physical faculties to develop and exercise. For this, no formal instruction is needed. If food and shelter are provided for him, he will grow physically without much instruction. His relationships with others, members of the family and outsiders, will develop spontaneously in the process of living. In all of these matters, a child will spontaneously exercise his faculties on these materials abundant in the world around him. Those precepts that are needed can be imparted relatively simply without need for systematic study. But there is one area of education where direct spontaneity and a few precepts will not suffice. This is the area of formal study specifically the area of intellectual knowledge. That knowledge beyond the direct area of his daily life involves a far greater exercise of reasoning powers. This knowledge must be imparted by the use of observation and deductive reasoning, and such a body of thought takes a good deal of time to learn. Furthermore, it must be learned systematically, since reasoning proceeds in orderly, logical steps organising observation into a body of systematic knowledge. The child, lacking the observations and the developed reasoning powers, will never learn these subjects by himself, alone, as he can other things. He could not observe and deduce them by his own unaided mental powers. He may learn them from the oral explanations of an instructor, or from the written testimony of books or from a combination of both. The advantage of the book is that it can set forth the subject fully and systematically. The advantage of the teacher is that, in addition to previous knowledge from the book, he knows and deals with the child directly and can explain the salient or unclear points. Generally, it has been found that a combination of book and teacher is best for formal instruction. Formal instruction, therefore, deals with the body of knowledge on certain definite subjects. These subjects are, first of all, reading, so that the child has a superb tool for future acquisition of knowledge, and, as a later corollary, the various language arts, such as spelling and grammar. Writing is another powerful key in the child's mental development. After these tools are mastered, instruction naturally proceeds in logical development, reading to be spent on such subjects as the world's natural laws, natural science, the record of man's development, his ends and actions, history, geography, and later the moral sciences of human behaviour, economics, politics, philosophy, psychology, and man's imaginative studies of man, literature. Writing branches out into essays on these various subjects, and into composition. A third elementary tool of great power is arithmetic, beginning with simple numbers and leading up into more developed branches of mathematics. Of these fundamental subjects, reading is of first importance, and for this, learning of the alphabet is the primary and logical tool. It has become fashionable to deride stress of the three R's, but it is obvious that they are of enormous importance, that the sooner they are thoroughly learned, the sooner the child will be able to absorb the vast area of knowledge that constitutes the great heritage of human civilization. 
They are the keys that unlock the doors of human knowledge, and the doors to the flowering and development of the child's mental powers. It is also clear that the only necessity and use for systematic formal teaching arises in these technical subjects, since knowledge of them must be presented systematically. There is clearly no need for formal instruction in how to play, in getting along with the group, in selecting a dentist, and the multitude of similar courses given in modern education. And since there is no need for formal teaching in physical or directly spontaneous areas, there is no need for instruction in physical education or in finger painting. Human Diversity and Individual Instruction One of the most important facts about human nature is the great diversity among individuals. Of course, there are certain broad characteristics, physical and mental, which are common to all human beings. But more than any other species, individual men are distinct and separate individuals. Not only is each fingerprint unique, Each personality is unique as well. Each person is unique in his tastes, interests, abilities and chosen activities. Animal activities, routine and guided by instinct, tend to be uniform and alike. But human individuals, despite similarities in ends and values, despite mutual influences, tend to express the unique imprint of the individual's own personality. The development of individual variety tends to be both the cause and the effect of the progress of civilization. As civilization progresses, there is more opportunity for the development of a person's reasoning and tastes in a growing variety of fields. And from such opportunities come the advancement of knowledge and progress, which in turn add to the society's civilization. Furthermore, it is the variety of individual interests and talents that permits the growth of specialization and division of labour on which civilised economies depend. As the Reverend George Harris expressed it, quote, Savagery is uniformity. The principal distinctions are sex, age, size and strength. Savages think alike, or not at all and converse, therefore, in monosyllables. There is scarcely any variety, only a horde of men, women and children. The next higher stage, which is called barbarism, is marked by increased variety of functions. There is some division of labour, some interchange of thought, better leadership, more intellectual and aesthetic cultivation. The highest stage, which is called civilization shows the greatest degree of specialization. Distinct functions become more numerous. Mechanical, commercial, educational, scientific, political and artistic occupations multiply. The rudimentary societies are characterized by the likeness of equality. The developed societies are marked by the unlikeness of inequality or variety. As we go down, monotony. As we go up, variety. As we go down, persons are more alike. As we go up, persons are more unlike. It certainly seems as though the approach to equality is decline towards the conditions of savagery, and as though variety is an advance towards higher civilization. Certainly then, if progress is to be made by added satisfactions, there must be even more variety of functions, new and finer differentiations of training and pursuits. Every step of progress means the addition of a human factor that is in some way unlike all existing factors. The progress of civilization then, must be an increasing diversification of the individuals that compose society. There must be articulation of each new invention and art, of fresh knowledge, and of broader application of moral principles. End quote. With the development of civilization and individual diversity, 
there is less and less area of identical uniformity, and therefore less equality. Only robots on the assembly line, or blades of grass, can be considered as completely equal, as being identical with respect to all of their attributes. The fewer attributes that two organisms have in common, the less they are equal, and the more they are unequal. Civilised human beings, therefore, are unequal in most of their personalities. This fact of inequality, in tastes and in ability and character, is not necessarily an invidious distinction. It simply reflects the scope of human diversity. It is evident that the common enthusiasm for equality is, in the fundamental sense, anti-human. It tends to repress the flowering of individual personality and diversity, and civilization itself. It is a drive toward savage uniformity. Since abilities and interests are naturally diverse, a drive toward making people equal in all or most respects is necessarily a levelling downward. It is a drive against development of talent, genius, variety and reasoning power. Since it negates the very principles of human life and human growth, the creed of equality and uniformity is a creed of death and destruction. There is a sense, however, in which equality among men is sensible and beneficial. Each individual should have the freest possible scope for the development of his faculties and his personality. In order to have this scope, he must have freedom from violence against himself. Violence can only repress and destroy human growth and endeavour, and neither can reason and creativity function under an atmosphere of coercion. If each person has equal defence against violence, this equality before the law will permit him to maximise his potentialities. Since each person is a unique individual, it is clear that the best type of formal instruction is that type which is suited to his own particular individuality. Each child has different intelligence, aptitudes and interests. Therefore, the best choice of pace, timing, variety and manner, and of the courses of instruction, will differ widely from one child to another. One child is best suited in interests and ability for an intensive course in arithmetic three times a week, followed six months later by a similar course in reading. Another may require a brief period of several courses. A third may need a lengthy period of instruction in reading, etc. Given the formal systematic courses of instruction, there is an infinite variety of pace and combination which may be most suitable for each particular child. It is obvious, therefore, that the best type of instruction is individual instruction. A course where one teacher instructs one pupil is clearly by far the best type of course. It is only under such conditions that human potentialities can develop to their greatest degree. It is clear that the formal school, characterised by classes in which one teacher instructs many children, is an immensely inferior system. Since each child differs from the other in interest and ability, and the teacher can only teach one thing at a time, it is evident that every school class must cast all the instruction into one uniform mould. Regardless how the teacher instructs, at what pace, timing or variety, he is doing violence to each and every one of the children. Any schooling involves misfitting each child into a procrustean bed of unsuitable uniformity. What then shall we say of laws imposing compulsory schooling on every child? These laws are endemic in the Western world. In those places where private schools are allowed, they must all meet standards of instruction imposed by the government. Yet the injustice of imposing any standards of instruction should be clear. Some children are duller and should be instructed at a slower pace. The bright children require a rapid pace to develop their faculties. Furthermore, many children are very apt in one subject 
and very dull in another. They should certainly be permitted to develop themselves in their best subjects and to drop the poor ones. Whatever the standards that the government imposes for instruction, injustice is done to all. To the dullards who cannot absorb any instruction, to those with different sets of aptitudes in different subjects, to the bright children whose minds would like to be off and winging in more advanced courses, but who must wait until the dullards are hounded once again. Similarly, any pace that the teacher sets in class wreaks an injustice on almost all, on the dull who cannot keep up, and on the bright who lose interest and precious chances to develop their great potential. Obviously, the worst injustice is the prevention of parental teaching of their own children. Parental instruction conforms to the ideal arrangement. It is, first of all, individualised instruction, the teacher dealing directly with the unique child and addressing himself to his capabilities and interests. Second, what people can know the aptitudes and personality of the child better than his own parents. The parents' daily familiarity with and love for their children renders them uniquely qualified to give the child the formal instruction necessary. Here the child receives individual attention for his own personality. No one is as qualified as the parent to know how much or at what pace he should teach the child, what the child's requirements are for freedom or guidance, etc. Almost all parents are qualified to teach their children, particularly in the elementary subjects. Those who are not so qualified in the subjects can hire individual tutors for their children. Tutors may also be hired where the parents do not have the time to devote to the formal instruction of their children. Whether or not they themselves should do the teaching, or which tutor is best for their child, is best determined under the overall supervision of the parents directly. The parents can determine the progress of the child, the daily effect of the tutor on the child, etc. In addition to parental instruction and tutorial instruction, the parents can send the children to private schools. This alternative, however, is not as satisfactory because of the necessary lack of individual instruction and individual pacing. There are classes with many children, set times for courses, set grades, etc. The only reason for schools instead of individual instruction is the economic one, that the price of individual tutoring is prohibitive for most parents. Consequently, they must adopt the only practical alternative of mass tutoring, where the teacher instructs many children at the same time. It is clear that such private schools are an inferior solution to individual instruction. Whichever pace the teacher sets, an injustice is done to many of the children. If the state enforces certain standards on the private schools, a far worse crime against the children is committed. For if the parents' selection of instruction is completely free and unhampered by state coercion, they, knowing and loving the child best, will be able to select the best type of instruction that they can afford. If they hire tutors, they will choose the most competent for their child. If they can select any type of private school, they will select that type which is best suited for their child. The advantage of unlimited development of private schools is that there will tend to be developed on the free market a different type of school for each type of demand. Schools will tend to be developed especially for bright children, for average children, and for dull ones, for those with broad aptitudes, and for those for whom it would be best to specialise, etc. But if the state decrees that there may be no schools which do not, for example, teach arithmetic, it would mean that those children who may be bright in other subjects, but have little or no aptitude for arithmetic, will have to be subjected to needless suffering. The state's imposition of uniform standards does grave violation to the diversity of human tastes and abilities. 
the effect of the state's compulsory schooling laws is not only to repress the growth of specialised, partly individualised private schools for the needs of various types of children, it also prevents the education of the child by the people who, in many respects, are best qualified, his parents. The effect is also to force into schools children who have little or no aptitude for instruction at all. It so happens that among the variety of human ability, there is a large number of subnormal children, children who are not receptive to instruction, whose reasoning capacity is not too great. To force these children to be exposed to schooling, as the state does almost everywhere, is a criminal offence to their natures. Without the ability to learn systematic subjects, they must either sit and suffer while others learn, or the bright and average students must be held back greatly in their development while these children are pressured to learn. In any case, the instruction has almost no effect on these children, many of whose hours of life are simply wasted because of the state's decree. If these hours were spent in simple, direct experience, which they were better able to absorb, there is no question that they would be healthier children and adults as a result. But to dragoon them into a school for a formative decade of their lives, to force them to attend classes in which they have no interest or ability, is to warp their entire personalities. The Parent or the State The key issue in the entire discussion is simply this. Shall the parent or the state be the overseer of the child? An essential feature of human life is that, for many years, the child is relatively helpless, that his powers of providing for himself mature late. Until these powers are fully developed, he cannot act completely for himself as a responsible individual. He must be under tutelage. This tutelage is a complex and difficult task. From an infancy of complete dependence and subjection to adults, the child must grow up gradually to the status of an independent adult. The question is under whose guidance and virtual ownership the child should be, his parents or the state's. There is no third or middle ground in this issue. Some party must control, and no one suggests that some individual third party have authority to seize the child and rear it. It is obvious that the natural state of affairs is for the parents to have charge of the child. The parents are the literal producers of the child, and the child is in the most intimate relationship to them that any people can be to one another. The parents have ties of family affection to the child. The parents are interested in the child as an individual, and are the most likely to be interested and familiar with his requirements and personality. Finally, if one believes at all in a free society, where each one owns himself and his own products, it is obvious that his own child, one of his most precious products, also comes under his charge. The only logical alternative to parental ownership of the child is for the state to seize the infant from the parents and to rear it completely itself. To any believer in freedom, this must seem a monstrous step indeed. In the first place, the rights of the parents are completely violated, their own loving product seized from them to be subjected to the will of strangers. In the second place, the rights of the child are violated, for he grows up in subjection to the unloving hands of the state with little regard for his individual personality. Furthermore, and this is a most important consideration, for each person to be educated, to develop his faculties to the fullest, he needs freedom for this development. We have seen above that freedom from violence is essential to the development of a man's reason and personality. But the state, the state's very being, rests on violence, on compulsion. As a matter of fact, the very feature that distinguishes the state from other individuals and groups is that the state has the only legal power to use violence. In contrast to all other individuals and organisations, 
The state issues decrees which must be obeyed at the risk of suffering prison or the electric chair. The child would have to grow up under the wings of an institution resting on violence and restriction. What sort of peaceful development could take place under such auspices? Furthermore, it is inevitable that the state would impose uniformity on the teaching of charges. Not only is uniformity more congenial to the bureaucratic temper and easier to enforce, this would be almost inevitable where collectivism has supplanted individualism. With collective state ownership of the children replacing individual ownership and rights, it is clear that the collective principle would be enforced in teaching as well. Above all, what would be taught is the doctrine of obedience to the state itself. For tyranny is not really congenial to the spirit of man, who requires freedom for his development. Therefore, techniques of inculcating reverence for despotism and other types of thought control are bound to emerge. Instead of spontaneity, diversity and independent men, there would emerge a race of passive, sheep-like followers of the state. Since they would be only incompletely developed, they would be only half alive. It might be said that no one is contemplating such monstrous measures. Even communist Russia did not go so far as to impose a communism of children, even though it did almost everything else to eliminate freedom. The point is, however, that this is the logical goal of the statists in education. The issue, which has been joined in the past and in the present, is, shall there be a free society with parental control or a despotism? with state control. We shall see the logical development of the idea of state encroachment and control. America, for example, began, for the most part, with a system of either completely private or with philanthropic schools. Then, in the 19th century, the concept of public education changed subtly, until everybody was urged to go to the public school, and private schools were accused of being divisive. Finally, the state imposed compulsory education on the people, either forcing children to go to public schools or else setting up arbitrary standards for private schools. Parental instruction was frowned on. Thus, the state has been warring with parents for control over their children. Not only has there been a trend toward increased state control, but the effects of this have been worsened by the very system of equality before the law that applies in political life. There has been the growth of a passion for equality in general. The result has been a tendency to regard every child as equal to every other child, as deserving equal treatment, and to impose complete uniformity in the classroom. Formally, this has tended to be set at the average level of the class, but this being frustrating to the dullest, who, however, must be kept at the same level as the others, in the name of equality and democracy, the teaching tends more and more to be set at the lowest levels. We shall see that since the state began to control education, its evident tendency has been more and more to act in such a manner as to promote repression and hindrance of education, rather than the true development of the individual. Its tendency has been for compulsion, for enforced equality at the lowest level, for the watering down of the subject and even the abandonment of all formal teaching, for the inculcation of obedience to the state and to the group rather than the development of self-independence, for the deprecation of intellectual subjects. And finally, it is the drive of the state and its minions for power that explains the modern education creed of education of the whole child and making the school a slice of life, where the individual plays, adjusts to the group, etc. The effect of this, as well as all the other measures, is to repress any tendency for the development of reasoning powers and individual independence, to try to usurp in various ways the educational function apart from formal instruction, of the home and friends, 
and to try to mould the whole child in the desired paths. Thus, modern education has abandoned the school functions of formal instruction, in favour of moulding the total personality, both to enforce equality of learning at the level of the least educable, and to usurp the general educational role of home and other influences as much as possible. Since no one will accept outright state communization of children, even in communist Russia, it is obvious that state control has to be achieved more silently and subtly. For anyone who is interested in the dignity of human life, in the progress and development of the individual in a free society, the choice between parental and state control over the children is clear. Is there then to be no state interference whatever in the relations between parent and child? Suppose that the parents aggress upon and mutilate the child. Are we to permit this? If not, where are we to draw the line? The line can be simply drawn. The state can adhere strictly to the function of defending everyone from the aggressive violence of everyone else. This will include children as well as adults, since children are potential adults and future free men. Simple failure to educate or rather instruct, is no grounds whatever for interference. The difference between these cases was succinctly put by Herbert Spencer. Quote, no cause for such state imposition can be shown until the children's rights have been violated, and that their rights are not violated by a neglect of their education, actually instruction. For what we call rights are merely arbitrary subdivisions of the general liberty to exercise the faculties, and that only can be called an infringement of rights which actually diminishes this liberty, cuts off a previously existing power to pursue the objects of desire. Now the parent who is careless of a child's education does not do this. The liberty to exercise faculties is left intact. Omitting instruction in no way takes from a child's freedom to do whatsoever it wills in the best way it can, and this freedom is all that equity demands. Every aggression, be it remembered, every infraction of rights, is necessarily active, while every neglect, carelessness, omission, is as necessarily passive. Consequently, however wrong the non-performance of a parental duty may be, it does not amount to a breach of the law of equal freedom, and cannot therefore be taken cognizance of by the state. End quote. Children's Associations Another powerful argument against compulsory education, one which is generally overlooked, is that if instruction is compulsory, and the parent cannot afford to send his children to a private school or tutor, and is prevented from instructing the children himself, he must send his child to a public school. In the public school will be most of the others who would not be there were it not for the universal compulsory law. This includes subnormal, uneducable children, and various types of juvenile delinquents and hoodlums. Whereas the parent would prefer not to send the child to formal schooling rather than to compel him to associate with these vicious types, the state forces him to do so, with incalculably evil consequences to innocent children. Removed for part of the day from the care and supervision of the parent, the child is compelled to associate with vicious companions and might even be influenced by them to join juvenile gangs, adopt drug addiction, etc. These are not exaggerated evils, as any reader of the current press knows, but, true to the common hatred of individual superiority and distinction, the passion for levelling an enforced equality proclaims, This is good. Let every child be forced to learn about life and be forced to associate with the lowest types of humanity. The envy and hatred toward the potentially better and superior child is apparent in this position, 
and underlies the argument for enforced equality and consequent suppression of superior individuality. Compulsory versus free education The Reverend George Harris described the effects of compulsory education in imposing uniformity and enforced equality soon after the establishment of compulsion. Quote, Education is already so generally provided in America and other countries, 1897, that without forecasting imaginary conditions, there is no difficulty in seeing how much equality is given by that opportunity. The same amount of time is given to all, the same courses are prescribed for all, the same teachers are appointed to all. The opportunity is not merely open, it is forced upon all. Even under a socialistic program, it is difficult to imagine any arrangement for providing the education which all are supposed to need more nearly equal than the existing system of public schools. Even Mr Bellamy, a prominent totalitarian socialist of the day, finds schools in the year 2000 AD modelled after those of the 19th century. All things are changed except the schools. Behind fifty desks exactly alike, fifty boys and girls are seated to recite a lesson prescribed to all. But the algebra is not an opportunity for the boy who has no turn for mathematics. Indeed, the more nearly equal the opportunity outwardly, the more unequal it is really. When the same instruction for the same number of hours a day by the same teachers is provided for fifty boys and girls, the majority have almost no opportunity at all. The bright scholars are held back, the dull scholars are unable to keep up, average scholars are discouraged because the brighter pupils accomplish their tasks so easily. End quote. In the 1940s, the English writer and critic Herbert Reed emphasised the diversity of man by pointing out the psychological objection to a compulsory national system of education. Quote, Mankind is naturally differentiated into many types, and to press all these types into the same mould must inevitably lead to distortions and repressions. Schools should be of many kinds, following different methods and catering for different dispositions. It might be argued that even a totalitarian state must recognise this principle. But the truth is that differentiation is an organic process. The spontaneous and roving associations of individuals for particular purposes. To divide and segregate is not the same as to join and aggregate. It is just the opposite process. The whole structure of education as the natural process we have envisaged falls to pieces if we attempt to make that structure artificial. End quote. The great philosopher Herbert Spencer pointed out the despotism inherent in compulsory education. Quote, For what is meant by saying that a government ought to educate the people? Why should they be educated? What is the education for? Clearly to fit the people for social life, to make them good citizens. And who is to say what are good citizens? The government. There is no other judge. And who is to say how these good citizens may be made? The government. There is no other judge. Hence, the proposition is convertible into this. A government ought to mould children into good citizens. It must first form for itself a definite conception of a pattern citizen, and having done this must elaborate such system of discipline as seems best calculated to produce citizens after that pattern. This system of discipline it is bound to enforce to the uttermost, for if it does otherwise, it allows men to become different from what in its judgment they should become, and therefore fails in that duty it is charged to fulfil. 
Mrs. Isabel Patterson brilliantly sums up the tyranny of compulsory state education and the superiority of free choice of private education. Quote, Political control is, by its nature, bound to legislate against statements of both facts and opinion in prescribing a school curriculum in the long run. The most exact and demonstrable scientific knowledge will certainly be objectionable to political authority at some point, because it will expose the folly of such authority and its vicious effects. Nobody would be permitted to show the nonsensical absurdity of dialectical materialism in Russia by logical examination. And if the political authority is deemed competent to control education, that must be the outcome in any country. Educational texts are necessarily selective, in subject matter, language and point of view. Where teaching is conducted by private schools, there will be a considerable variation in different schools. The parents must judge what they want their children taught by the curriculum offered. Then each must strive for objective truth. Nowhere will there be any inducement to teach the supremacy of the state as a compulsory philosophy. But every politically controlled educational system will inculcate the doctrine of state supremacy sooner or later whether as the divine right of kings or the will of the people in democracy. Once that doctrine has been accepted, it becomes an almost superhuman task to break the stranglehold of the political power over the life of the citizen. It has had his body, property and mind in its clutches from infancy. An octopus would sooner release its prey. A tax-supported compulsory educational system is the complete model of the totalitarian state. End quote. Here we must add that in the current system, the state has found a way in the United States to induce the private schools to teach state supremacy without outlawing private schools as in some other countries. By enforcing certification for minimum standards, the state effectively, though subtly, dominates the private schools and makes them, in effect, extensions of the public school system. Only removal of compulsory schooling and enforced standards will free the private schools and permit them to function in independence. Mrs. Patterson deals succinctly with the problem of compulsory education and literacy. Quote, but would not some children remain illiterate? They might, as some do now and as they did in the past. The United States has had one president who did not learn to read and write until after he was not only a grown man, but married and earning his own living. The truth is that in a free country, anyone who remains illiterate might as well be left so. Although simple literacy is not a sufficient education in itself, but the elementary key to an indispensable part of education in civilization. But that further education in civilization cannot be obtained at all under full political control of the schools. It is possible only to a certain frame of mind in which knowledge is pursued voluntarily. End quote and Mrs. Patterson answers teachers and educators who would tend to reply in epithets to her criticism. Quote, Do you think nobody would willingly entrust his children to you to pay you for teaching them? Why do you have to extort your fees and collect your pupils by compulsion? End quote. One of the best ways of regarding the problem of compulsory education is to think of the almost exact analogy in the area of that other great educational medium, the newspaper. What would we think of a proposal for the government, federal or state, to use the taxpayers' money to set up a nationwide chain of public newspapers and compel all people, or all children, to read them? What would we think, furthermore, of the government's outlawing all other newspapers? 
or indeed outlawing all newspapers that do not come up to the standards of what a government commission thinks children ought to read. Such a proposal would be generally regarded with horror in America, and yet this is exactly the sort of regime that the government has established in the sphere of scholastic instruction. Compulsory public presses would be considered an invasion of the basic freedom of the press, yet is not scholastic freedom at least as important as press freedom? Aren't both vital media for public information and education, for free inquiry and the search for truth? It is clear that the suppression of free instruction should be regarded with even greater horror than suppression of free press since here the unformed minds of children are involved.